Good morning, everyone. I'm Ethan. And I'm Davin, and we are here to give you some exciting things that are happening in the life of our church. Mm -hmm. First up is Discover First is coming soon. It'll be September 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. It's a great opportunity if you're new and looking for more information about FBC, want to get involved, or you're considering membership. <laughs> Sign up on our website at fbcbolivar.org for Discover First. Yep, Kingdom Man Rising is coming, and that is October 9th, 16th, and the 23rd. Mm -hmm. It'll be each Saturday from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., and that breakfast will be served there. Possible bacon, might be bacon. Maybe. So we have group discussion, then Bible study is going to be a good time. Mm -hmm. And bacon's there, bacon's there. Uh, Missouri Mission Offering is happening through the month of September. It's a great opportunity to give to so many mission opportunities throughout the state of Missouri. Your money goes to programs such as disaster relief, Christian foster care, summer missions, rescue from human trafficking, and other items. So midweek is back on, and that's Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. And so students from 6th to 12th grade, we can meet in the rec building uh, starting at 6 p.m. So come join us for some worship, Bible study, and a good time. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning in worship. Yep. And if you want any more information about the events going on at our church, you can head to our website, fbcbolivar.org, or pick up a happenings card, a worship guide, or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Have a great Sunday. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning. We are so happy that we can be gathered uh, with one another this morning. We want to welcome anyone who might be a guest with us this morning, especially, and uh, you can text the word guest to the number that's up on the screen. We'd love for you to visit uh, one of our info hubs that we have out in the lobbies. Uh, we have a gift for you there, and so we'd love to just be able to get your information so that we can connect with you uh, and know that you're here. Um, let's go ahead. Let's stand this morning as we begin. Uh, let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this time that we could be in this place together. God, as we worship with one another this morning, as we gather in core groups, God, as we serve in um, different areas, Lord, I pray um, that all of these things are done to honor and glorify your name. And Lord, as we're here, that you move among us. God, that your spirit is guiding us, drawing us closer to you. God, and by your spirit, by your power, that we are going into this world and showing them who you are. God, be with us now as we worship you, as we hear from your word. Lord, let us be changed and be made more like you. Let us look on you and see your faithfulness and find our comfort, peace, and hope in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. <clears throat> Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you are? Oh, how high I'd scale the valleys if you graced the other side. Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise? Against the rush of grace descending, from the source of its supply Cause in the highlands and the heartache You're neither more or less inclined And I would search and stop at nothing You're just not that hard to find Oh, I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valley, you're the same. No less sky within the shadows. No less faithful in the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache, all the same. Oh, how far beneath your glory does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past. Oh, how fast would you come running if just a shadow me through the night trace my steps through all my failures Walk me out the other side 
whisper who could dare ascend the mountain the valley hill called calvary before the one i call good shepherd who like a lamb was slain for me oh i will praise you on the mountain i will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet are so i will praise you in the valley all the same no less god within the shadows no less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart is in the highlands in the heartache all the same Wherever I stand, if ever I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows my song of ascent. Whatever I walk through, wherever I am, your name can move mountains. Wherever I stand, if ever I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows my song of ascent, my song of ascent. My song of a sin. Whoa, whoa. And from the gravest of all valleys come the pastures we call grace. A mighty river flowing upward from a deep but empty grave. I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valley all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is the highlands and the heartache all the same. And the King of Lord be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from.
We're going to go into this next song. I want to read for us from Psalm 19, uh, which is where we'll be today um, as Adam brings the word for us again. Um, we get down to Psalm 19, verse 7, and David's writing. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. And he ends this chapter by saying, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And as we go into this next song, that's, um, that's what we're going to sing that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart are pleasing to God, that we are dwelling on his word, and that's what, that's what propels us, that's what drives us, that's what guides us by his spirit, is his word that calls us to live how we do as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's sing.
Father, we, we know that you are holy. We know that you are good. And we ask, God, that you would be here with us, uh, that you would stir our hearts, God, to, to see the goodness of your word, uh, to know that it is true, to know that it is working in us, God. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to, to move amongst the people, amongst us, um, to be the representation of, of Jesus, what he has done through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. And may all that we do, um, whether we eat or drink or worship, sing, listen, preach, pray, God, may we do all things to your glory. And may we love you with all that we have because you first loved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, good. There we go. You'll explain why. Maybe I'm a little bit slow on the draw in the morning, this morning in just a second. Have your Bibles, take them and join me in Psalm 19. We'll try that again. And we're going to look specifically at verses 7 through 14 this morning. But I'll read the text in its entirety in just a moment. But as you find your place there, let me just give you a little bit of an update about me and, and my family. And as I do this, just letting you know how you can pray for me today, but also be praying for me and my family and others this week. As you probably remember, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana and serve New Orleans Seminary there. And you may or may not have heard, but we have a major hurricane that's about to reach the status of a Category 5. And whether it does or not, that just means it's a major storm that's bearing down on the Louisiana coast. And really within the next hour or two, we'll begin making landfall. And it's, in t it's, it's, it's projected to have some major impacts in the city of New Orleans. As a matter of fact, the city is prone to flooding and losing power and expecting we're expecting all of those things to occur. And so basically what that means is on Friday, I was actually supposed to get on a plane yesterday and fly here yesterday, but on Friday when all the reports and projections started coming in, our president sent out a, a video and basically told the faculty and the staff, hey, get your family and get off campus and get somewhere safe. And so that's actually what we did. My family and I loaded up on Friday afternoon. My in-laws live about three hours south of here, just the other side of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so we got in the car, my wife, myself, and our four children, and we drove to uh, Arkansas, got there about 2 a.m. Saturday morning, yesterday morning, made sure they were safe. And this morning I got up at 3 a.m. because I love you guys so much <laughs> and couldn't wait to be with you and uh, got in the car about 4 and got here a little bit after 7 so we're running on coffee and adrenaline. We'll see how that goes. But we've already seen that it's not going so well because I couldn't even turn a microphone on. But we'll pray that the sermon goes better than that. With all that being said, I'm excited about being with you guys. But in all seriousness, I would appreciate prayers for my family. We're good. We're safe. Prayers for New Orleans Seminary. But also just prayers for South Louisiana and specifically the city of New Orleans. We don't know what the next several days hold, but as we always say, we know who holds the next several days. But that is not why we're gathered together today. We're gathered together today to worship Him and to look at the Word together, and so let's do that this morning. So as I begin, let's look together at verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 19. And here's what the Word of God says. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. 
There is no, no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance is to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. David Platt told a story several years ago about him being on a week to 10 day long mission trip in a country in South Asia. And while he was there, because the area is so diverse religiously, he worked with a lot of different groups that have a lot of different religious backgrounds. He worked with Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and he told the story that near the end of his trip, he was having a conversation one day, and in this conversation, there were two holy men for, from two different religious backgrounds. One was a Buddhist, and one was a Hindu, and they were just talking about their beliefs. And near the end of the conversation, one of the other holy men said to David that it just seems to him like that all believe that there's this mountain. And, and on top of this mountain is paradise or heaven or God or whatever your concept of that is. And all of us in our religions are just trying to work our way to the top of that mountain. And so David responded and said, what I hear you saying is that we're all headed to the same place. And we all have different paths, different steps, if you were, to get there. But we're, but we're all trying to get to, to heaven or God or, or whatever we assume is at the top of the mountain. And they said, yeah, that's exactly right. We'll come back to that in just a moment. What I think the story David told really gets at for us is something that absolutely is innate or inherent in the human condition. All of us have probably asked this question and to some extent all of humanity deals with this scenario. And it comes out in a lot of different forms but basically the questions are these. Is there a God on top of that mountain? And if there is, what is he like? What is that God like? And, and maybe more importantly than that is how, how in the world do I get up to him? How can I have a relationship with that God if there is one and I find out about him? And then beyond that, once I'm in relationship with him, how do I continue to relate with him? I believe in Psalm 19, the first half of which I've already read for you this morning, David, the psalmist here, is answering, if you will, at least implicitly, or helping us answer those questions. As he wrote to ancient Israel, he was describing for them how they can know that God. And by extension, he's giving us some applications of how we can do the same. And he's doing so in what we might call a comparison and contrast. I think the natural reaction when we think about a comparison and contrast is we think that we are emphasizing that something else is good to the detriment of something else. That is not what David is doing here in this psalm. Both parts of the comparison have value, but he shows us the value of one to show us the exceeding value of the other. The comparison contrast in some ways is, is so unique that many scholars, as they looked at Psalm 19 in the past, actually believe that this was the makeup of two different psalms. Originally, they were two different psalms written by two different authors, and just later they were put together. And the reason why is because the subject matter of verses 1 through 6 seems to be so different than the subject matter of verses 7 through 14, as does the language and I will tell you, I actually think that's a misunderstanding of what David's doing, and I absolutely believe that it was originally intent to, uh, written as one for the intent of showing us this emphasis. As a matter of fact, one evangelical scholar said it this way of that position. He said, It is a common yet grievous deception of the enemy to lead us to separate the God of nature from the God of grace. For we know they are one and the same. And in verses 1 through 6, the psalmist here shows us how the God of nature uses nature to show something about himself in order for us to understand the uniqueness of how God uses his written law 
to reveal how to be in relationship with him. Before we look at verses 7 through 14 and really settle in there, let me just say a word or two. We're really going to spend our time in verses 7 through 14, but a word or two about what we see and the uniqueness of the emphasis in verses 1 through 6. I wish I had time to spend in here. If, if I was with you more, I would have done a two-parter on this psalm, and we'd have looked at verses 1 through 6 and verses 7 through 14 next. But what we do see is that, that God, what we might call his general revelation, what God does in nature is profitable for us. It holds some profit. As a matter of fact, it, it lets us know some things. According to Paul in Romans 1, as a matter of fact, there he said that we're all, mankind is without excuse because that which can be known about God has been known. And I believe there he's talking about what we would call general revelation. And I think the psalmist emphasizes this. There are certain things in nature that can be known. Number one, it can be known from nature that there is a God. Creation lets us know there is a creator. I believe it also lets us know about God's power, his kindness, his genius, and his trustworthiness. Maybe we would say it like this. Here's what I like to say when we look at verses 1 through 6. General revelation or nature certainly shows us God's godness. But if we had time to look, we would see that the psalmist also emphasizes that there is some limitation there. We can know there is a God, but not necessarily how to be in relationship with that God. And that's really what David is going to show us beginning in verse, verse 7. If we compare this to what we read in Psalm 1 in light of Psalm, excuse me, Romans 1 in, in light of Romans 10, which we will look at a little bit later in the message, here's what we understand. Nature or general revelation is enough to make us unrighteous or expose our unrighteousness. But it's not enough to lead us to the one who makes us righteous. For that, we need God's special revelation. We need God's word, which we see in verses 7 through 14. Look with me in verses 7 through 14. And here's what we read. The law of the Lord is perfect. Restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They're more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock. And my Redeemer. We see that, if, you, if it were, God's, all of God's revelation is profitable for us, but God's special, specific revelation in his written law is uniquely valuable to us. And I want to show you very briefly three truths from what we see in verses 7 through 14 that show us the profitability, the usefulness, the value of the written law of God in our life. First of all, in verses 7 through 9, we see that there is a complete trustworthiness of God's word. Because of my role at the seminary, I've become very acquainted with the late Dr. Adrian Rogers. As a matter of fact, I knew him a little bit before then because I'd listened to him on TV for quite a few years, and there are days that just in life I, I miss Adrian Rogers, and there's times that I feel like the Southern Baptist Convention really misses an Adrian Rogers. He had a way of saying things that would bring unity sometimes that I think a lot of other people don't possess, but he also had a way of saying things that would bring vividness to our minds about what we were reading from God's Word. As a matter of fact, some people call these Adrianisms. I don't know if that's the best thing to say or not, but one of his Adrianisms related to the Word of God, and here's what he said. He said, a Bible that's falling apart is evidence of a life that's not. Clearly by that, what he was indicating is 
there is a general principle. The more we are in his word, the more we are being shaped into Christ's likeness and the, and the closer we draw to the Lord uh, that's indicated through our reading of the word, the more in line our life is going to be with him. If that doesn't resonate with you, perhaps the modern hymn that Michael W. Smith sang will connect the dots. Michael W. Smith said it a little bit different. He's saying, ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. By the way, worship band, uh, worship team, there's a reason I did not sing those lyrics, and hopefully you'll never have to find out why, because I won't sing while I'm mic'd. As we look at verses 7 through 9, we see, if it were, Six synonyms that David uses for the written word of God. And in these synonyms, or, or with these synonyms, he gives these descriptors that let us know, that point towards how we can trust God through his word. Just listen to some of these very, very quickly. Listen beginning in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Restoring the, the soul. Perhaps what the psalmist here is talking about is the sufficiency of the word of God in our life to lead us to faith in God, but then also to help us grow up in our faith. The Holy Spirit uses those things in our life to help us know God and walk with God. Notice here that continuing the descriptor, the psalmist says that the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. I think sometimes we read this descriptor, we think that this is indication that sometimes we're just having a bad day or bad week, that we're feeling blue, that we're downtrodden. And in those moments, we can just open God's word anywhere, and the Holy Spirit of God will use that in our life to pick us up when we're feeling down. Now, that very well may be true, but that is not what the psalmist is referring to here. And I say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because of the term that he uses for restoring. It's the same Hebrew word that's used in other places in the Old Testament that means repent or return the soul. You'll remember for a moment Psalm 23 where we're told the Lord is our shepherd and as our shepherd the Lord restores our soul. David being the author of that psalm also being the author of this psalm there said it's the Lord that restores our soul and here he says it's the law the perfect law of God that restores our soul. How can that be? Well, is it not that often it's the very written word of God, it's the very law of God that we can read and understand that God uses in our hearts to draw us back to him when we've wandered far from him? It is the very written law of God that God uses to return or repent the soul that's wandered far from him. As we continue in verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is, Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Perhaps this means that there's no false claims in the Word of God. So when we learn from the Word of God, when we become wise by the Word of God, we can understand that what we have is indeed that divine truth. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. There is an indication that the Word itself is righteous. Because it comes from a righteous God. What do we mean by that? When we read a truth claim, when we read a call from God's holy word, we don't have to understand or guess if it's that which is good for us. We know if it comes from the Lord who is righteous, that it itself is right and calls us to that which is right and places that which is right in our very souls. Continuing in verse 8, The commandment of the Lord is pure, Enlightening the eyes. Some have said this is talking about the clarity of the Word of God. We've said of the Word of God before that it's, it's so deep, its depths are like that of an ocean of which the wisest and the most skilled and learned could never plumb the depths of. Yet at the same time, it's so accessible and shallow that even a babe can take a drink of water from it and not drown. Yes, there's a depth to it, but there's also an understandability to it. There's a, clear, there's a clearness, a clarity to the Word of God. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring 
forever. And some have said that there's an eternality to the Word of God, that it will not fade away, that it will not pass away, that it will stand, and God will bring all of His promises in Christ to His people to bear. We read ourselves, do we not, that God tells us, listen, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. And then finally, we read the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. In other words, that which is there is what God intended to be there. There are no errors in the Word of God. And so as we look at what the psalmist writes, we understand as we come to the end of verse 9 that certainly there is a complete trustworthiness of the Word of God. We, we can trust that which God has given us, what God has preserved for us. Sometimes perhaps we're accused of, of loving the Bible more than we love God or loving the Bible instead of loving God. But friends, I would say to you, I love the Bible because I love God and it's through the Bible that I know God. He's given me his word so I don't have to guess, so we don't have to grope in darkness so we can know who he is and how to be right with him. And that's the place that we put the word of God in as it relates to our relationship with him. So there is a complete trustworthiness and we're thankful for the word. And with that being said, David doesn't end there. But in verse 10, he shows us because of this trustworthiness of the word of God that also there's this cherished nature of the Word of God, verse 10. Of the precepts, the commandments, the judgments, the written law of God, he writes, they are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. The Word of God itself, because of what it is and because who gave it to us, is cherished. It should be cherished by us. Just for a moment, consider the images. Consider the description that the psalmist gave us here as to how we should understand desiring God's Word. He picked two items that maybe for us seem quite strange. Maybe not the gold one, but the drippings of the honeycomb. But place yourself in the shoes of ancient Israel. From an economic standpoint, what is more certain than the precious metal of pure gold? In some ways, it gives you economic status and it gives you economic security. Yet David, writing one who would have known as king what that meant, writes and doesn't say that the written precepts, judgments, law of God is as desirable as gold. What does he say? It's more desirable than gold. We should desire it more than even economic security. But just in case that doesn't resonate with us, look what he says here. He says, not only that, but it's sweeter also than honey and the drippings of a honeycomb. Now, understand, David and the audience that he was originally writing to could not just jump in their car or their chariot or, hell, or, uh, or horse or, or, or camel or whatever the case might have been and gone down to the Dairy Queen and gotten the Rhesus Extreme blizzard. They, they couldn't have done that. So when you're thinking about that which is satisfi satisfying and brings a sweetness and a sustenance, David picked the sweetest thing he could say and think of, and he said, look, God's word, his precepts, his judgment, his law, are even sweeter to the person of God than those things. There's a complete trustworthiness to God's word. There's a cherished nature to God's word. And we might ask ourselves ultimately, why is this word so cherished? Well, the psalmist begins to transition and answer those questions in verses 11 through 14. We get the crux of it. We get the summary of it. It, it comes to a conclusion, if you will, beginning in verse 11. Listen to what he writes. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Quit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Verse 11. Moreover, by them, by your precepts, your judgments, your testimony, your written law, by them, your servant is warned. Warned about what? 
Warned from what? And he continues, in keeping them, there is great reward. Great reward in, in comparison in regards to what? And from whom? Well, in verses 12 and 13, we see the answer to the first question. In verse 14, I believe we see the answer to that final question. Look what the psalmist writes in verse 12. Who can discern his errors? By the way, the anticipated answer to that question before a holy God is no one. It's a rhetorical question, but the psalmist is expecting that everyone reading or listening would go, not I, not me, and he continues and says, acquit me of hidden faults. Now, what in the world does he mean by errors and hidden faults? I often ask students, even when I'm walking through this passage of Scripture, are there categories of sins? And normally, because of what we think and how we think about our relationship with God through Christ, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, no, that all sins are the same in the eyes of God, and where it is absolutely true to say that one sin is an affront to a holy God and, and makes us rightly under the wrath of God, if you look at the Old Testament and examine it somewhat closely, you will see that there actually are categories of sin, believe it or not. Let's look at a place like Numbers 15. We'll have time to look at it today, but Numbers 15 gives us two categories of sin. The first category is what the author of Numbers refers to as unintentional sins. These are the sins that you commit that you might not even know is a sin. You might not even know you did it. It's not like you contemplated it, bore out all the, all the outcomes and results and consequences and committed that sin. These are sins that you might not even know is an affront to a holy God. Now understand that even in the Old Testament, these sins are considered serious, and they took atonement. But it's a different category. I think that's what the psalmist is referring to, what David is talking about when he says his errors. These are things in his own heart that he doesn't know that he's done against God. But yet he understands that it's the law of God, it's the precepts of God, it's the commandments of God, it's the judgments of God, it's the testimonies of God that will even reveal things that are sin that you might not know so that you can stay away from them. What is it that's going to cause me Knowing what a sin is to stay away from. You say with the Holy Spirit working in our lives, but yet we read, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I what? Might not sin against you. Because the words in the heart, we are, we are acquitted, we are held back from those errors. But there's a second category of sin. And this is what I believe David's referring to in verse 13. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. What in the world are presumptuous sins? Well, in the book of Numbers 15, there they're referred to as high-handed sins. Oh, you and I know what these are. We've committed them. These are ones that you know absolutely from the moment you're tempted to do it that it is an affront to a holy God. You know what God's Word says. You know the conviction of the Spirit in your heart. But you play with it. You think about it in your mind. You think about what it would be like to do it, the enjoyment that you would get out of it. You know the consequences. You know that it's, it's absolutely unrighteous before a holy God, that it creates a barrier between us, but after contemplating it in full knowledge, you do it anyway. Those are sins, if I can say it this way, that presume upon the grace of God. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. And that's the high-handed sins that are being referred to in the second part of Numbers 15. Now the question is, what was often, how serious were these sins and what was often the consequences in the Old Testament for committed a high-handed sin? Often it was death by stoning. So David looks at the written law of God that can be trusted, that should be cherished, and he says, one of the reasons I cherish it because it's even God's word that will hold me back, that will keep me from ever committing these high-handed sins. And in not ever committing them, they won't rule over me. By the way, David was one, if anybody, that had a testimony of committing high-handed sins. It was him. And he says, and then, having not committed them, them not ruling over me, I shall be acquitted of great transgressions. Could it be because of the very sin nature that we hold and the work of God's Spirit through His Word that holds us back and forgives us of these sins as the one reason why the written law of God, the revealed Word of God, is so cherished to us and by us. But perhaps verse 14 shows us even more clearly why David cherished it and called us to as well. Just listen. He says, let the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart. Literally, the song of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth, let those things that I say about you, let my testimony that I give to others, let my service of you through my words be pleasing and acceptable to you. How, for a sinful man like me, is that even possible? And then let the meditation, the song of my heart, let my worship in my, when my, in my own private time and when I gather with your church, let my worship be acceptable and pleasing to you. Let it be worship that's worthy of who you are. Again, how is that possible for any of us? David is saying, he's, he's requesting of God something that is impossible in and of himself and in and of ourself, which really gets to the point of why we value the Word of God so immensely. He hints at it at the end of verse 14. Did you catch it? Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, listen, I I don't want to go too far with this, and certainly if we have any biblical studies or Hebrew professors in the room, don't come throw anything at me at the end of the service. I'm certainly not saying that David here specifically has in mind and knows Jesus and all the details that would come with him dying on the cross. But I I would say that this title is intentional, I believe. David is understanding God. He's looking to God. He's having faith in God to be his redeemer. To do something for himself that he knows he could never accomplish. Extend grace to him that allows him to serve God with his words and to worship God with his heart in a way that's pleasing. And the only way that happens is through faith in God as redeemer. Now, we understand that redemption ultimately comes through Jesus Christ, does it not? That's how we know, that's how we've experienced redemption, and that's how we have a redeemer. So essentially, what we see here is that all of God's revelation, if we had to look at the conclusion of this, all of God's revelation is profitable because it proclaims his glory. But God's written word is specifically valuable to us. Watch this. Because it explains His grace. So David is sitting there with these two holy men and the question's been posed, don't we all see our path to God the same way? Aren't we just taking different paths? Different paths, but they lead to the same place. And so, again, David says, so you're saying there's one location. Whether that be paradise or heaven, God, however we see it, and we're all working our way up the mountain. They said, that's exactly right. And David said, he, he looked at him and said, that's very interesting. He said, but I have a question for you. He said, what if God came down off the mountain to us? Because that's what God has done in Jesus Christ. And that's the only way, that's the only way that we can know Him, relate to Him, serve Him, and worship Him in a way that's pleasing. Listen, Jesus is the living Word of God. The Bible is the written Word of God. And we value and we're thankful for the written Word of God because it bears testimony to the living Word with God. And it shows us who that God is on that mountain and how to be right with him. Just listen. I told you we would circle back around to Romans 10 to what we read beginning in verse 8. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul about the same subject. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen to verses 14 through 17. How will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, 
who has believed our report. Look at verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Adrian had another Adrianism concerning the written word of God that leads us to the living word of Christ. And here's the way he said it. He said, I've read many books, as we probably all have, and all are. He said, but the Bible reads me. One of the great reformers of the church, Martin Luther, said it this way. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays a hold of me. May we, because of Christ, and our desire to know who our great God is, to be in relationship with our great God and King, and to walk with Him, say that we are those, as individuals and as a church, that the Bible, that the Word of God has laid a hold of. Would you pray with me this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. As the worship team begins to make their way back up to the front, let me just say to you, if you're here today and you don't know that God on top of the mountain, let me just say that He, in the form of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, He sent His Son in the flesh to come and die on a cross so that you might know Him and be in right relationship. May today be the day of salvation for you. If you do know Christ, today would you understand the calling and, and, and the gift of having his word so that we can continue to have Christ formed in us so that we can continue to walk with God, serve God with our words and our actions, and worship God in our heart. I'm going to pray when I say amen. We're going to sing and we're going to respond in worship to our great God. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your powerful word. Thank you for this truth and its clarity, and thank you for pointing us to your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Thank you that through Christ, you came down off the mountain. And thank you that because of that, we can know you and we can walk with you. May we be a people today that love you through your word and walk with you as we obey what it says in the Spirit. Father, we just pray that you would have your way, that you would move, and that you would do all this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. Stand as we sing.
great morning of worship we've had this morning. Thank you, Adam, uh, for bringing that word from Psalm 19 for us. I would just want to say, um, if you have anything that you'd like to talk with a pastor about, um, we'll have some people here. Afterward, you can also text the word connect, um, and we'll have somebody who will reach out to you through the week. Uh, Just if you have any questions about next steps, um, what it means to follow Jesus, um, if your next step is being baptized, getting plugged into a core group, we'd love to help you with that. Uh, So we'll have someone here, or you can text the word connect. Um, And then also we have um, some buckets in the back. Uh, We have different ways of giving online um, that you uh, can be able to do that if you want to continue worship through giving. Uh, Just a couple things, and then I'll pray us out uh, this morning. First, um, we've kind of had a serve emphasis this past month, and so we do still have some iPads out in the main lobby. And so if you uh, have been thinking about wanting to sign up to serve somewhere, we encourage you uh, to sign up. You can use the iPad. You can go to fbcbolivar.org backslash serve be able to sign up there as well. Um, And then last, any of our college students who might be in here, um, we have college students meeting over in the rec building, which if you go out these back doors and walk directly across the street, um, you can go over there. Um, We'd love to have you guys go over there. Dave, our college pastor, will be over there, um, be able to meet with you guys. And so if you haven't had a core group or anyone to plug into, we'd love for you guys to do that. So let me pray for us, uh, and then we'll head out. God, thank you again so much for this morning. Uh, for this time that we could be together as brothers and sisters, as family, as your body. God, this time that we could grow in our knowledge of you, of your word. God, I pray that as we have heard from your word this morning, God, that we just don't um, sit on that, but we take that, that impacts us, that affects us, that causes us to move from where we've been, that causes us to go out, God, to to pray that your kingdom come and your will be done here among us as it is in heaven. Lord, may that be true for us, Lord. May we live in your spirit and your power. God, we know we are under your grace and your love. Thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys have a great day.